Continuing on with higher order derivatives, going back to our painkiller example, we have done all parts of this except for part E. So let's go ahead and go to that part. It asks, over what time period is the concentration changing at a declining rate? Now, this is a little bit misleading here because you see the word rate and you think, oh, well, I'm going to go ahead and do my derivative equation, which we also labeled as my rate equation. But we have to think about this in a little bit more content. We want to know when our rate is declining. Now, let me go back to my last example. We wanted to know when the concentration, meaning when our original equation was declining, so if we ever want to know when the original equation is declining, notice that we used our derivative equation or our R equation. So if you ever want to do increasing and decreasing, then you have to use the next derivative. So if we want to know when our rate is increasing or decreasing, that means that we're going to have to do the next derivative. So we're going to have to use the second derivative of our original equation, or we're going to have to do the derivative of our rate equation. So one more time, if you ever want to figure out if one function is increasing or decreasing, then you use the next derivative. If I want to know when my rate is increasing or decreasing, then I use my next derivative, r prime of t, which so happens to be the second derivative in this equation. We did compute that in part b. And so I just have copied and pasted it from there. So for the same reason that we set this equation equal to zero here, because that's going to be where our graph changes directions from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing. We are going to set this derivative equal to zero here, because that's where our first derivative, our rate equation, is going to be switching directions, increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Now, right now we're just going to pick out where it's switching directions, and then we're going to use that to specifically tell us at where it is declining. Okay, when I set this equal to zero, I know that I can, again, eliminate my denominator by multiplying both sides by it. So I just need to set both parts of my numerator equal to zero. The first one, when I set 80 t is equal to zero, that gives me the solution t equals zero if I divide both sides by 80. The second one, 8t squared minus 27 equals 0. Isolating my t squared, that gives me 27 over 8. If I square root both sides, I need to force in a positive and a negative. But we're talking about time, so only the positive answer applies. Simplifying both of these, Square root of 27, I can write as square root of 9 times square root of 3. So that gives me 3 root 3. And in the last example, I simplified square root of 8. That gave me 2 root 2. This is my most simplified exact answer. But in applied problems, we always want to know an answer that makes sense. So if we compute the decimal approximation of this, that gives us, 1.837. This is in time. So we're talking about something's happening at zero hour and something's happening at 1.837 hours. So our rate equation is switching directions in between increasing and decreasing at that time. But which is which? Let's go ahead and utilize the graph. I have my original equation still plugged in here just for a point of reference, but it's not important in this part. I did plug in my second derivative equation here into y3 just because I wanted it to graph in red. Let's go ahead and look what this graph looks like. So I have it here. Again, the blue is my original equation. The red is my second derivative equation. Well, if I want to know when my 
rate is declining, that means I want to know where my second derivative or my rate derivative is less than zero. We figured out where it's equal to zero at, but now we need to specifically locate where it's less than zero. That means when it is below the x-axis. So now let's look back at that on the graph. We see it starts to go below the x-axis at my origin. So that was our one value, t equals zero. And we see it starts to come back above my x value at somewhere around in here. Now, it might be hard to see, so we might need to zoom in a little bit closer to this x-axis, but it does cross my x-axis at this point right here, which we came up to be t equals 1.837 hours, and then it slowly declines again back to the x-axis, but it never crosses again. Let me go ahead and zoom in so we can see this more specifically, what's happening around this here. I'm going to zoom in really, really close. I'm just going to go to one-tenth above and below. So here I have my one-tenth above, one-tenth below, and I adjusted my scale accordingly. We're going to be zoomed in quite far. Again, the blue was my original equation. And the red is my second equation derivative. So we can see that it starts to go below my x-axis here at 0, and it crosses back here at 1.837, and then it comes above, and it stays above the rest of my graph. And we can do a limit as t approaches infinity to see what really happens on the right side of this graph here to confirm that it doesn't cross again. But to go back to my question, when is my concentration at a declining rate? Meaning, when is my second derivative or my rate derivative below zero. Well, we found it is between these two values here, when it is past zero hours, but shorter than 1.837 hours. So my final answer is when my time is greater than zero hours, but shorter than my 1.837. And this is, of course, in hours. So one more time, let me explain why we use the second derivative here. We wanted to know when our rate equation was declining. So if we ever want to know when something is increasing, decreasing, going up, going down, or specifically declining in this problem, we want to use the next derivative. So to figure out where our rate is declining, we use the derivative of our rate equation our prime of t, or the second derivative overall. And then specifically where it's declining, that means where it was below the x-axis. We figured out algebraically where it was equal to my x-axis at. I confirmed with my graph that it was below the x-axis between these two values. And so we came up with this answer here. And this finishes up all of my examples of higher order derivatives. And so therefore, this finishes up this section completely.